Just as soon as I arrived at the Yaqui village, the Mexican storekeeper told me he had rented a record player and was planning to give a fiesta that night. The Yaquis didn't dance. They watched with apparent delight every movement the Mexican dancers made. They seemed to be enjoying themselves, just watching and gulping down cheap tequila. I circulated among the numerous Indians and talked to them and offered them drinks. My pattern of behavior worked until they realized I wasn't drinking at all. That seemed to annoy everyone at once. It was as if collectively they discovered that I didn't belong there. The Indians became very gruff and gave me sly looks. The Mexicans, who were as drunk as the Indians, also realized at the same time I hadn't danced and that appeared to offend them even more. They became very aggressive. One of them forcibly took me by the arm and dragged me closer to the record player. Another served me a full cup of tequila and wanted me to drink it all up in one gulp and prove I was macho. I tried to stall them and laughed idiotically as if I were actually enjoying the situation. I said I would like to dance first and then drink. One of the young men called out the name of a song. The girl in charge of the record player began to search in the pile of records and had trouble fitting a record on the turntable. Everybody closed in around her and left me. That gave me time to run behind the store, away from the lit area and out of sight. I stood about 30 yards away in the darkness, trying to decide what to do. I was tired. I felt it was time to get to my car and go back home. I began to walk to where my car was parked. I saw some dark silhouettes of people walking in the opposite direction, going towards the party. We passed each other and they mumbled, Buenas noches. I recognized them and spoke to them. I told them it was a great party. It was a dark starless night, but the glare from the store lights allowed me to have a fairly good visual perception of my surroundings. My car was near and I accelerated my pace. I then noticed the dark shape of a person squatting to my left at the bend of the road. The person seemed to be defecating on the side of the road. That seemed odd. People in the community went into the thick bushes to perform their bodily functions. I thought that whoever was in front of me must have been drunk. I came to the bend and said, Buenas noches. The person answered me with an eerie, gruff, inhuman howl. The hair on my body literally stood on end. For a second, I was paralyzed. Then I began to walk fast. I took a quick glance. I saw that the dark silhouette had stood up halfway. It was a woman. She was stooped over, leaning forward. She walked in that position for a few yards, and then she actually hopped. I began to run while the woman hopped like a bird by my side, keeping up with my speed. By the time I arrived at my car, she was cutting in front of me, and we almost touched. I leaped across a small dry ditch and jumped in my car. My experience had been so unnerving that the next day I drove to Don Juan's house instead of going back to LA as I had planned to. Don Juan returned in the late afternoon. I didn't give him any time to say anything, but blurted out the whole story. Don Juan's face became somber. You should have known it was something serious the moment you noticed the shadow was to your left. You shouldn't have run either. What was I supposed to do? Just stand there? Exactly. When a warrior encounters his opponent, who is not an ordinary human being, he must make his stand. That's the only thing that makes him invulnerable. What are you saying, Don Juan? I'm saying you had your third encounter with your worthy opponent. She's following you around, waiting for a moment of weakness on your part. She almost bagged you this time. I felt a surge of anxiety and accused him of putting me in unnecessary danger. I complained that the game he was playing with me was cruel. It would be cruel if this would happen to the average man. But the instant one begins to live life like a warrior, one is no longer ordinary. I didn't find you a worthy opponent because I want to play with you or tease you or annoy you. A worthy opponent might spur you on. Under the influence of an opponent like Catalina, you have to make use of everything I've taught you. You don't have any other choices. From now on, you must be on the lookout. She'll try and tap you on your left shoulder during a moment when you're unaware and weak. What should I do? Everything you did last night was clumsy. First of all, you went to the party to kill time, as if there's time to kill. That weakened you. You mean I shouldn't go to parties? No, I didn't mean that. 
you can go any place you wish. But if you do, you must assume the full responsibility for that act. A warrior lives his life strategically. He would go to a party like that only if a strategy called for it. That means, of course, he would be in total control and would perform all the acts that he deemed necessary. You're in a terrible bind. Your opponent is on your trail. And for the first time in your life, you can't afford to act helter-skelter. This time you'll have to learn a totally different doing. The doing of strategy. Think of it this way. If you survive the onslaughts of Catalina, you'll have to thank her someday for having forced you to change your doing. What a terrible way of putting it. What if I don't survive? A warrior never indulges in thoughts like that. When he has to act with his fellow men, a warrior follows the doing of strategy. And in that doing, there's no victories or defeats. In that doing, there's only actions. I asked him what the doing of strategy entailed. It entails that one's not at the mercy of people. At that party, you were a clown. Not because it served your purpose to be a clown, but because you placed yourself at the mercy of those people. You never had any control, and thus you had to run away from them. What should I have done? Not go there at all, or else go there to perform a specific act. After horsing around with the Mexicans, you were weak. Catalina used that opportunity. She placed herself in the road to wait for you. Your body knew something was out of place, and yet you spoke to her. You must not utter a single word to your opponent during one of those encounters. Then you turned your back to her. That was even worse. Then you ran away from her, and that was the worst thing you could have done. Apparently, she's clumsy. A witch that's worth her salt would have mowed you down right then. The instant you turned your back and ran away. At the time, your only defense was to stay put and do your dance. What dance are you talking about? He said that the rabbit thumping he had taught me was the first movement of the dance that a warrior groomed and enlarged throughout his life and then performed during his last stand on earth. Don Juan suddenly looked at the sky and told me there was still time to go and check the sorceress. He reassured me that we were in very little danger because we were only going to drive by her house. You must confirm her shape. Then there will be no doubts left in your mind, one way or the other. We got in my car and Don Juan directed me to the main highway and then to a wide, unpaved road. We went slowly amid a thick cloud of dust. He told me to slow down as we crossed a small bridge and a gentle curve in the road. That's the woman's house, Don Juan said, pointing with his eyes to a white house with a high bamboo fence. He told me to make a U-turn and stop in the middle of the road. We stayed there perhaps 10 minutes, but it felt like forever. Don Juan did not say a word. He sat there motionless, looking at the house. There she is, he said, and his body gave a sudden jump. I saw the foreboding silhouette of a woman standing inside the dark house, looking through the open door. The woman stepped out of the darkness and stood in the doorway, watching us. We stared at her for a moment, and then Don Juan told me to drive on. I was speechless. She was the woman I had seen hopping by the road in the darkness. About a half hour later, when we turned on the paved highway, Don Juan finally spoke to me. What do you say? Did you recognize the shape? I hesitated for a long time before answering. I was afraid of the commitment involved in saying yes. I carefully worded my reply and said that I thought it had been too dark to be completely sure. He laughed and tapped me gently on the head. To survive Catalina, you must make use of everything I've taught you. <laughs>